Hello, good afternoon. I'm Michael Hover. I'm the head of services at Adfinisci Group. We are a uh, open source provider based in Switzerland. And today I will talk about um, GitLab CI and how we basically leverage it to um, automate certain painful or annoying tasks. So who of you already knows GitLab or already has it in place? Okay, more or less all of you, so we can um, more or less rush through the short introduction of GitLab. So GitLab is um, quite similar to GitHub, but basically you can host it on premise and um, you get all those nice and fancy features that you are used to. Um, so you have uh, all the those workflows you can follow and the, the Git workflows. Of course, it provides a nice uh, fancy web interface and you have the role, role user group uh, concept. In addition, you can uh, integrate the two different tools like Mattermost, so you get uh, notifications each time someone merge a re merges a request or accepts a pull request, whatever, and other tools as well, of course. Um, GitLab itself is uh, open source, um, as mentioned, and they basically provide two uh, versions, so to speak, a community edition and two separate enterprise editions. Uh, GitLab itself is more or less a basic rail stack. They do have some additional tools that are not, or components that are not directly written in Ruby. And the data for the repositories is stored on disk and uh, additional data on the data database. <coughs> And of course, traffic gets proxied through whatever web server you prefer. Uh, what is kind of unique uh, with GitLab um, is that they use something like they call an omnibus installation. That means they have one um, big torball um, which um, <clears throat> packages all those different dependencies that you need, ranging from Postgre to web server to all the RubyGem dependencies and whatnot. This makes it, of course, easy to maintain the whole application stack, and you can also install it on uh, older uh, distributions like Debian 7, where you would basically um, miss all those uh, RubyGems. On the other hand, it raises certain security issues. So you basically trust the, the ladies and gentlemen at GitLab that they will um, uh, maintain the whole package and really update and uh, add those security patches. GitLab CI is um, their continuous integration component. And it's basically uh, one small application that is written, or one binary written in Go. And they provide uh, different kind or different varieties of uh, executioners that you can use. Uh, so you can roll, run your builds uh, in a basic shell environment um, or uh, containerized in, 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 as a Docker Im in a Docker image, uh, VirtualBox, um, and also more advanced um, executioners like Kubernetes. So you can automatically deploy pods uh, in your Kubernetes instance. After the installation, you can basically in, uh, execute the GitLab CI multi-runner um, command to register this uh, uh, machine server um, in your um, GitLab instance. So you have the possibility to either register the runner as shared. That means you can use, for example, uh, a Docker um, image build environment for different projects, or you can um, register it as a specific, specifically for one project. Um, and the command is uh, pretty simple. Just type in the, the URL, of course, a token, which is either um, available globally for the shared 
um, runner or project specific and of course the executioner type that you want to use. So those uh, runners will then basically pull GitLab every few seconds to see if there are new commits. And if they see um, that something has changed, they will pull uh, all the data from GitLab, which makes it um, more integratable into different network environments. So you don't have to worry about um, ports and firewall rules and whatever. The, the configuration of the, the build workflow or the steps that should be taken care of um, is basically done in this GitLab CI YAML file. Um, if you're already familiar with Travis or Jenkins 2.0 um, with the Jenkins file, um, it's more or less the same. And of course, it, the runner will execute those tests and upload all artifacts if there are any back to GitLab. So if you build a package or a binary, it will be available in GitLab. So here a short example. Um, this is um, a snippet from, from our Vault client. Uh, we wrote a, um, a Go-based um, CLI tool to access the HashiCorp Vault server. So before starting the, the test uh, run, we mock or start the Vault server. So we can run the tests against it. And we define two stages. The first basically um, will take care of the tests themselves and afterwards we build the, the Go binary. So again, here are those two stages. Um, first uh, run the tests and then build the Go binary. At the bottom you can see that the artifacts are then stored um, or will be stored after the build in the we C directory, and this is also the directory that will be finally uploaded back to GitLab as the artifacts. Our infrastructure um, is not too fancy. Uh, we have just one virtual machine for GitLab. We actually use GitLab Enterprise for, I guess, two to three years, years now. Uh, we, of course, started uh, with the community dash edition, but then decided that we also want to su support the developers because it's basically one of our core components and we really use it uh, on a daily basis. We have two dedicated hardware servers for the CI environment, so one Docker runner where most of the builds are executed and one dedicated VirtualBox runner um, for more um, heavy testing like uh, running <coughs> complex Ansible playbooks and stuff like that where you basically need to have multiple servers in a virtual machine or multiple services, sorry, and um, as you usually just run one simple service in a Docker container. We have around 100 users that uh, use um, Git, our GitLab instance, and 30 of them are uh, heavy users that um, use it on a daily basis. So let's have a look at some more interesting pipelines um, as we've covered uh, the basics. Uh, we had more or less three uh, pain points that we really want to cover um, in the past few months. So one of them was that, of course, um, previously when we used uh, Jenkins, even before we had GitLab, um, we didn't have a fully automated testing environment, for example, front-end applications, or uh, we basically write quite a lot of documentation uh, on in, in RST and render it with Sphinx. Or um, we have different um, workshop and training slides that are based on Markdown um, notes. And all of them should be basically rendered and published automatically. And of course, the same goes for packages. Um, these can be especially annoying if you have to build them manually. Of course, sign the packages and then publish them on the repository server.
as mentioned already, um, most documentations um, from the developers are written in RST and we render them uh, to HTML or PDF uh, documentations with Swinx. Um, trainings or the, the slides are user, usually written in Markdown and then we um, display them with Reveal.js. So we have those fancy um, slides that you can view in your browser. These can, of course, be quite easily rendered with uh, GitLab CI. Just um, execute the, the required commands, um, and you will have them available as artifacts. But how do you now publish those slides or documentations? So you can either push them directly during the build process to your web server, or you can trigger a webhook, which is uh, in in my opinion, the, the cooler way to do it. So for that, we wrote a small Python-based web server, which basically accepts webhooks from GitLab. It will then, um, or the, the webhook will basically tell the web server which repository was, um, um, or which build was run, etc., and it will take care of uh, downloading the, the artifacts and extracting the documentation to the specific document route. It's also on, available on, on GitHub if you are interested. Um, it may have some rough edges, of course. And this is what it looks like, for example, when we build the training slides. So again, this is the GitLab CI YAML. Um, nothing too interesting about it. We just have a single command or several commands that um, are required to, to build the documentation and afterwards um, upload them as artifacts to GitLab. For um, managing the, the stock spot, uh, which will take care of extracting, extracting and placing the the artifacts on the web server, um, you need to create a dedicated file. This is um, really based on the GitLab CI YAML file. So just tell it where it, those artifacts should be extracted to a certain delay, because sometimes the, the trigger will be faster than uploading the artifacts. So you can have this kind of race condition. And basically, um, which stages um, should be taken care of. So, um, of course, if you just run the test stages, it shouldn't um, deploy any documentations because they weren't built. Afterwards, you need to grant um, a user or you would need to grant um, the, the permissions, read permissions to a specific user. And that's also the one that will be used to access GitLab through the API. And of course, you need to uh, configure the webhook. So um, each time uh, something changes or a build is triggered, um, it should also trigger that URL. Um, so the, the doc spot is uh, kicked off. And in the end, if such a build passed, it will basically look like this. And it will have um, built all the required um, training slides and stuff like that. So we, for example, have training materials for SUSE Manager and you have those nice slides. For the packages, um, we basically build them in Docker containers as well. So um, we build Debian packages and RPM packages, and again, upload them to, to GitLab as artifacts. But uh, now comes more or less the, the real question, how do you publish them? So we use um, aptly which is um, a Swiss army knife, like a Swiss army knife tool for Debian repository management. Um, it's quite powerful. You can create snapshots, mirror uh, other repositories, create repositories with your own packages, uh, merge different snapshots and publish them. So it's, you're quite flexible. And for 
or you know, we use aptly and pyaptly, and pyaptly is basically um, a small wrapper around aptly, which makes it configurable with uh, with a YAML file, so you don't have to hassle with all the CLI commands. And as aptly currently do does not support um, RPM packages, we use the, the default uh, core tools, just RPM, Create Repo, and GPG for the CentOS or yeah, SUSE repositories. Um, for the publishing process, we took a similar path like for the docspot. So we have a small web server which is running on the repository server. Um, this web server again is triggered by, by a webhook, by GitLab. And afterwards it will basically extract the whole artifacts, place them in a defined structure and then trigger the required commands to update their packages. Again, if you're interested, um, the project is on, on GitHub as well. So, first you will have to pre prepare a certain directory structure on the repository server. This is just um, where basically the, the bot will um, extract the packages to. So it, Basically at the very top, you have the repository name and of course then the different distributions and releases and the, docs bo uh, the package bot will basically place all those packages uh, into the specific directories. Afterwards, again, like for the docs bot, um, a small uh, YAML configuration is required in your repository. So you first define the repository um, where the packages should be available at after the, the public publishing process. Again, a download delay uh, if required. And you can define the branches um, that should actually trigger updating the packages. So if you have, for example, um, if you commit regularly on a testing branch, you might not want to publish the, the build packages, of course, to your uh, upstream repository server. Afterwards, uh, you have the packages um, part. That is a little bit tricky because uh, we have to find out um, basically which packages belong to what distribution and to which release. And for that, um, you basically define um, the different distributions and releases and then tell um, the, the package bot um, which blob or regex should be matched for certain packages. So you can see it will basically take all RPM packages in that case, um, no matter what version they are, and place them in the CentOS uh, directory. Again, uh, the package bot will need access to the repository to read the required data and artifacts, and it will be triggered by, by a webhook, the same as for the docs bot. And if that all runs through basically, um, you should see the, the packages available in your repository. Can quickly show that. So shame on us, we do not have yet played around with OpenSUSE. But here, for example, you can see that we built um, um, the package bot package with the package bot. And it was automatically um, placed after the build in the required um, repository. And you have all the signatures in place so you can validate the package. So why don't we just use uh, OBS? So in our case, OBS would basically have been an overkill because we don't have that many packages and I already have uh, set up uh, OBS in the past for another company and they still use it today. 
but it at that time it, it was ver very very painful to set up so i'm not sure if anyone already has um, experience in setting up obs but at that time um, quite a lot of documentation was missing but when we were able to to get it uh, running it was uh, quite nice but again, for us, it would have been an overkill to have a dedicated environment just for yeah, a few packages or, yeah, of course, you, you basically get uh, more packages for each project, but again, not that many pro uh, packages. And of course, mostly um, Intel or AMD 64 based and not RM packages or whatever. So as a takeaway, just remember to to start easy if you are um, already using a CI tool. Um, basically, remember that you have to eat an elephant piece by piece and not uh, take too big leaps. Are there any questions? All right, thank you very much.